And uh, yes, that's Michelle Zachs, our associate director who just joined. Let me just explain, I am actually in the Beinecke Library where I'm doing research most days. And up here in the mezzanine, those of you know who know Yale in this <laughs> glorious space, uh, since it's not being used, they allow the staff and uh, I guess regulars like me to come up here and eat our lunch. So today I'm gonna conduct our session from up here. So if I, if I talk a little low, it's because I'm in the great space of the Beinecke, but I can hear everybody well. And now and then if someone comes by, I may have to do this. So hello, welcome. I wanna get right to the, to the event of today. Uh, it, this is a very special uh, Wednesday brown bag. Well, I'm still calling them brown bags. And by the way, I brought my lunch. So I'm, I'm in the tradition of brown bags here today. It's lunchtime. Um, this is a very special one, though, because of this Witness Stones project. Our two guests who will share the platform and present for about a half hour, 40 minutes, are Dennis Culleton, who's the founder of this Witness Stones, I'm sorry, Witness, yeah, Witness Stones project. Um, he's a former member of the Marine Corps, a graduate of UMass. Um, he took degrees in economics and anthropology. Is an MA in history from Quinnipiac University. And for almost three decades, he's been a secondary high school teacher um, in Guilford. And it is out of that teaching that this project has especially evolved. And his partner in this project now is Joy Burns. I'd like to say our own Joy Burns because jo Joy has joined us uh, as a very active participant in the Yale and Slavery Project, uh, as what we're calling a community person, but she's much more than that. Um, she has degrees in medical science from Emory University, um, from the Montefiore Medical Center and the City College of New York. She is a physician's assistant at the Smilo Cancer Center here at the New Haven, uh, the Yale New Haven Hospital. And if some of you have not had the, uh, the uh, good fortune to be involved at the Smilo for your own reasons, if you ever are, you'll be glad to meet Joy. Um, she, she has all, all kinds of other involvements in the medical world. And indeed, part of her career was inspired by the AIDS epidemic uh, way back in the 80s and 90s. Um, she's a member of the local Amistad committee here in New Haven. That's only one of her many community involvements. Uh, she's also involved in the Elm Community Insight Project. And as we said, she's a member of this Yale and Slavery uh, Research Working Group. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over. Is it to Dennis first? Is that what? Yeah, okay, great. Tell us about this project. How did you get into it? What is it all about? And uh, welcome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Blight. And it's so nice to be here. What a, what a treat it is to uh, be invited to present at the Guild Lerman Center. Um, and we, uh, I think Joy and I both appreciate the mentoring that uh, Michelle has given us to help us um, um, get to this point with the project. You know, we. Joy and I met each other about a year ago and, and, um, uh, and, uh, and it had to do with trying to work with teachers and students to tell the story of enslaved people here in New Haven. So I'm gonna start out with an introduction to the Witness Stones Project, and then we'll go on to talk about kind of our gathering at the New Haven Museum, and then the work we're doing with the teachers and students in New Haven, and then some ideas we have of how this project could expand into the um, Yale community. So um, we want to start out with a land acknowledgement. We stand on Quinnipiac land. I'd like to acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations, the Hamanasset, Nahantic, Pequot, and Mohegan to the east, the Korchog and Manasset to the south, the Wappinger and Pagasses to the west, and the Wangunk and Tungsis to the north. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Um, you know, this we talk about colonial New England and part of what this project does is, is have us reimagine what colonial New England was about. 
in colonial Connecticut, we held the most enslaved persons of any colony in New England in 1779. And just about every Connecticut municipality listed in the 1790 census had, had enslaved persons. We can see on, on this particular uh, um, extract from the 1774 colonial census that New Haven had um, about 260 um, and, and um, African people of African descent, and majority of which we believe were um, were slaves. It also includes um, the indigenous people who were left in New Haven by this time, and the only amount of people counted were eleven. And the sadly for us researchers, it's after the seventeen after the uh, when the uh, U.S. Census began. Uh, indigenous people weren't counting, I think, until after the 1860s. So that's uh, kind of a tough thing for us um, when we're doing research, but we can see these communities, some of which you live in um, and, and where the enslaved people um, were, um, where we had groupings of enslaved people or individual enslaved people. Um, where do we uncover the stories of slavery? Well, there's all different places to find that. Uh, but there's places, you know, occasionally something that this book was issued, uh, written in the 1990s. This book talks about the, uh, some of the enslaved people in Guilford. Um, in Wyndham County, um, Ellen Larned, I think in about uh, eight, uh, 1890, she wrote a book and it includes some of the anecdotes about enslaved people. But oftentimes to find enslaved people, we have to go to the original sources. We have to go to probate records. Uh, including wills and probate inventories uh, and distributions. Uh, we have to go to um, property records. We see property records where enslaved people are bought and sold. And then we see, in this case, it says the emancipation of Achilles Negro. This is where Achilles was freed under a 1792 law that allowed his enslaver to free him and then not be responsible when Achilles reached uh, uh, old age or when he was no longer able to take care of himself. Um, lucky for us researchers, places like Ancestry is now making lots of stuff available, including vital records and church records where enslaved people are found. And occasionally, and I like to point this one out, this is one of my favorites, we see this, this, this fellow named Lyman Beecher who was born in New Haven and lived um, in North Guilford. And he talks about, if we look up here, it says, old priest fathers Moses was quite the man of business sent Johnny Fowler to college and paid the bills, managed a farm, rung the church bell, and was a factotum. He lived a slave because he lived a slave because he was a king. So those three or four lines here in Lyman Beecher, the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, in his autobiography, when he's being interviewed by Harriet Beecher Stowe, opens our minds to try to begin to understand what did slavery look like if all these things happen. If Moses had all of this agency to pay for his son, for his uh, enslaver's son to go to Yale, to, to run, you know, run, uh, run the farm, pay the bills and do all these things. What, what world did, what was slavery like in New England? And this was one of the early documents that got me to think, wow, I don't, I don't really, really understand this because this is not what I, if I imagined slavery at all in the North, that is not how I would have imagined it. So, we have, we'll just go back one uh, for just a moment. And if we go back, we can see we have other documents, you know, um, you can extract people of color from the census. The 1790 census gives us a lot of names of enslavers, but no names of, of the enslaved. It also shows us a lot of uh, free people of color, free blacks were living in white households, probably in, in some level of servitude. So the 1790 census is a rich place to get started. Uh, church records are fantastic in some towns and nothing in others. And that had to do with whether the preacher was interested in baptizing and, um, and uh, providing the sacraments to the enslaved people in the community. Uh, New Haven, pretty rich source. I think we've, we've gotten over 150 enslaved people just from the congregational church records. And then we have, a, um, we have other documents, different towns have things like books of mortality or bills of mortality where enslaved people are listed alongside other people. And because they felt they had to, every person of color was pointed out as being either a Negro or mulatto or colored or black. So it does, it allows you to extract out information that you might not otherwise find. Um, 
So with this is, this, these are some of the questions. If we believe that slavery was critical to the development of our country, if we believe slavery shaped the, uh, the beliefs about race in our country, and, it's, and if slavery was the main cause of the Civil War and that the enslaved resisted their bonds and still contributed to the growth of our country, how can we re remember and restore the history of the enslaved? How can we restore their history and honor their humanity is the question we have. So this is the Witness Stones project. It was inspired by the Stolpelstein project in Germany. Um, a friend of mine, Doug Nigren, came back from Germany after seeing the stones and previously hearing me speak about my um, foundational research here in Guilford and said, could we remember the enslaved here in Guilford the way Jews are remembered in Germany before they were kidnapped, where they lived freely before they were kidnapped and murdered under the Holocaust. We went back to the people in Germany and said, would you mind if we are inspired by you? If we also use stones to tell the stories of, uh, of people who were treated in an awful way here. And they, they understood immediately uh, the connection and they gave us their blessing, which was really nice. Um, so where our project restores the history of the enslaved, honor their humanity, we research enslavement, engage the students and educate the citizenry. The best case scenario with this project is we're teaching the teachers to bring it to their students. And then the students are creating biographical sketches, poetry, artwork, and other things to bring the project into the community through installation ceremonies, uh, talks at, at historical societies, talks at libraries, and um, hopefully a few months from now we'll be doing <coughs> a lot of this in person. Um, again, we do teacher staff training. We have to discuss what colonial and early American looked like. If you, if you believe that um, we had a slave economy here, you have to change the way teachers were taught about slavery. So we have to re, kind of recalibrate uh, what their understanding of colonial Connecticut, colonial New England was. Uh, we look at these five themes of slavery. I'll show them to you in a minute. We researched and find documents to help the, uh, tell the stories of an individual enslaved peoples in their communities. Uh, we share the uh, Witness Stones curriculum and we assist in, uh, in an installation ceremony. On the left is, is, is uh, we see Greenwich vital records and under it, it says <clears throat> David. Uh, so this is David Bush um, um, had, uh, under David Bush, it says, David had Negros Jack, son of Candace, and Hester, daughter of Candace. So he's listing under David Bush's name, the enslaved people he held in captivity. Um, so how do we do this? How do we get the kids and the teachers to understand slavery? We do it through a jigsaw activity. And if you're not an educator, you might not be familiar, but a jigsaw activity is when you give a group of people one topic or one theme to explore, and then they come back and share it with the other people in the classroom so everybody has a piece of the puzzle and they bring it back together to put together the whole understanding the recurring things that came out as we uh as we put together the curriculum or with dehumanization uh in, or in the enslaved as property separately the treatment of the enslaved because we want to point out we want to break that mess that slavery was good or easy in the north uh, we have paternalism economics of slavery. And, and if you do study economics, you realize that <laughs> economics is, can give you an answer to every question you have when it comes to society. It doesn't have to, but it can. And then human agency and resistance. How did these enslaved people fight their bonds, fight, uh, resist the, the lives that, that were, that were uh, institutionalized and, and show their own humanity? Um, and that's not easy to do because the people keeping the records and telling the stories 250 years ago didn't want to tell a story of the humanity of the enslaved because if they were humans, then they had to be treat human, treated humanely. Where if you were able to dehumanize them, um, then you were able to treat one, them like the other. And, um, so, <clears throat> and you know, showing agency through past and present successes, we have been able through the Witness Stones Project to tell a, a greater story of Moses and the life that he lived um, his stone is in front of the town hall in Guilford, and we know that he is the uncle of, uh, or multiple great uncle of Lieutenant Colonel Bertram Wadsworth Wilson, who fought in three wars, and it was a Tuskegee Airman, and of uh, recent state senator Pat Wilson Phineas, uh, who was the commissioner of social services in Connecticut. So we can see 
this family and we could see the agency per generation and it comes down from uh, what we saw when they were purchased 1728 in Boston to there's some 13 year olds today that are part of the same family of uh, uh, that Moses belonged to. And black lives have always mattered. That's something that this project really brings to the surface. If you understand the dehumanization 250 years ago, if you understand the black codes, treatment, buying and selling of persons, those, those things help us understand why we're fighting to have people understand that black lives do matter today. It didn't start in the South. It didn't start somewhere else. It didn't start before the Civil War, after the Civil War, it started right here, right in the, in the places we're sitting today. Uh, that's where Black lives were diminished. And we have to tell that story. We have to tell that truth in order to bring to the truth for today. Uh, on the right, we see places where the Witness Stones Project is active right now. And I would say that map is gonna begin to really fill in next year with a lot of inquiries that we're receiving right now. Um, and, you know, what are the learning outcomes? Uh, we want the students to become consumers and producers of information literacy, collaborate and communicate with their peers, local historians present their individual and shared understanding. This, this idea of civic engagement, public history, we're having the kids do public history, where they're telling the stories for the first time of some of these enslaved people, uh, and build on the foundation to discuss hard history, hard history towards the path of truth and reconciliation. And um, this Vice President Kamala Harris, when she was inaugurated, uh, when she was uh, nominated to the Democratic Party, she said, there is no vaccine for racism. We have to do the work. And, and that's, that's what we're here doing. So um, I think right now we're gonna turn over the discussion to Joy. Hi, Joy. Hey. Um, so we started out, Dennis and I and um, a group of teachers uh, started out our inquiry asking um, about enslaved people in New Haven. Um, above, you can see the photograph of a picture of the Party Morris House, which is in Morris Cove, um, a section of New Haven. It was built in 1685 by Thomas Morris, who was one of the founding members of New Haven Colony. Um, his grand nephew, Amos Morris, um, is the person who we really took a look at. And um, here um, you can see a letter that was written actually by Amos Morris III um, in 1825 regarding a young man by the name of Eli Bailey. Um, Eli Bailey was indentured to uh, Amos Morris II who passed away in 1823. And um, Amos, uh, what happened was Eli Bailey requested that he be allowed to visit his family in Guilford. And uh, the letter from Amos Morris to the select men of Guilford is, um, uh, Mr. Morris is a bit piqued because it is December and Eli left in September and did not return. Um, we. I was able to find the letter in uh, the book Disowning Slavery by Joanne Pope Malish. And uh, it was in a meeting with Dennis when he mentioned Eli and Frederick Bailey. And that was how we first made the connection. Aha, we have these stories of, of folks in common. So the next slide, Dennis, please. Sure, and, and um, so as as Joy was looking at Eli uh, Bailey at the Party Morris House, I was I think at the time still living in the uh, Nathaniel Johnson House, and that's where Frederick Bailey was held, and um, he I, he wasn't enslaved, but he was bound out. So we see, so uh, I had re, I had gotten from a friend uh, Tracy Tomaselli this runaway notice she had found for a Negro boy named Frederick Bailey. This is forbid all persons harboring, trusting, employing, and dealing with said boy without my order, and that's Samuel Johnson. Um, and and Samuel Johnson was a pretty pretty sharp guy. His um, you know his his uh, I think first cousin once removed signed the uh, U.S. Constitution. His uh, great uncle uh, found uh, left uh, was I think was thrown out of Yale and founded this school called King's College, which later became Columbia University. The guy uh, Reverend Dr. Samuel Johnson also. I think uh, founded about 40 Anglican slash Episcopal churches in, in, um, in Connecticut. Um, and then on the left, we see that this same Samuel Johnson, not that Samuel Johnson, but the, 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 uh, 
the person who held um, bail, uh, bail in captivity, he, he wrote the first American English dictionary with a fellow named John Elliott, I think about 20 years before Noah Webster, but uh, the people up in West Hartford aren't really, I, I think they've acknowledged that. <laughs> I, I joke with them all the time. That, but anyway, so we, we were literally looking at brothers while we were doing, um, when we sat down to talk about this project. And, um, and so what, what, you know, what was also happening at the same time, I was working with kids in, in Madison at the country school, and they were uh, looking at uh, the story of Latouse Bailey. So Latouse Bailey was freed by a fellow named John, Reverend Jonathan Todd, who was, I think, the class of 33 out of, uh, 1733 out of Yale. And he, in his will, makes this beautiful language about how he thought slavery was bad and how he, it would be a, a, a sin or a stain against his uh, estate, his in inheritors. Uh, but he didn't, he decided not to free them until he, uh, until they became of age, uh, but he, I'm sorry, until he died. So, uh, and then he, when he did free them, he, um, his nephew, who, um, who was the, um, who inherited much of the estate, he decided a couple of years later to free Latouse again. Uh, but later on, we see Latouse, and, and, and it's hard to see right here, but we can see uh, right here in uh, 1813, September 29, we can see that in the town of Guilford, this is the almshouse records, it says Latouse, to binding out two of your children. So the town is putting against her account, uh, two of her children being bound out. And we believe this is where Eli and Frederick are bound out in 1813 from, um, from the town of Guilford out to Samuel Johnson um, and to Amos uh, Morris. Um, yes, and so here are records from um, Old Saybrook. Um, we're fast forwarding several years and um, Eli and his brother Frederick have reunited in Saybrook and indeed they both have gotten married. Um, and to me, this demonstrates that they were resilient and they were able to navigate the indenture. Um, and then they were able to, they had goals, they were resilient and they were able to, uh, uh, to, to reunite and to gather as family and to create their own families and have a vision for their lives for the future. So, so even though we look at the life of Latouse and we're, we're trying to investigate the agency and maybe we see it in the next generation where her sons resist their captivity and, um, and we like to you know, believe that's happening on the, on the lower right, we see the, the Witness Stones Memorial for Latouse and it shows that she's freed in 1791 through um, the, uh, the last will and testament of Reverend Jonathan Todd. And then again in 1793 by his nephew to make sure that his nephew wouldn't be responsible for Latouse in her old age because the 1792 law dropped right in between there. And this is, and this is how we're able to uh, understand that although they, Reverend Todd wanted to freeze enslaved people, his nephew certainly didn't want to be responsible for them. Uh, financially. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, um, we, we, we are able to now kind of like look at that stone and look underneath it and see what's really happening. Um, so this is a slide that demonstrates how we kind of came together for the collaboration. It was actually Josh Sloat, a teacher at Cold Springs, who I initially said, this is a project I want to do, but I don't exactly know how to do it. And Josh took the initiative and emailed Dennis and um, Khalil at New Haven Museum and asked for the first meeting that we all had together. Um, and this is a list of all the teachers and all the folks at New Haven Museum who came together so that we could pull this project together for um, the young people to do the jigsaw projects and then to eventually um, be able to install the stones um, at the new at the party Morris house uh, in Morris Cove. Uh, the two people who we actually chose for the project are Stepna and Pink. Um, on the right, you can see the marriage record. Um, they were married in May on May 15th, 1791 at the first congregational church in New Haven. Um, at the time, Pink was the servant of Captain Mar Amos Morris 
and uh, Stepna was the servant of Isaac Forbes. That was the euphem euphemism that was used for enslaved people. And next slide, Dennis. Thanks. Um, here you can see a list that we compiled of um, eight people who we, we've been able to document thus far based upon the records of the town of East Haven. Um, eight people who were enslaved and at some point lived at the Pardee Morris house. Um, among them is an infant child who died, I think, at the age of two. Um, and then there were several adults. Keijo um, died on Christmas um, 1773. He actually drowned. And the next slide, please. Yeah, um, so we see, you know, one of the documents, the first documents that we found, which was super important, were the um, emancipations or manumissions. We, you know, they use the term emancipation, and I think it's easier. And um, where we found these were in the East, East Haven property records. If you know the history of New Haven, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to botch this, but about 1870, 1875, East Haven couldn't keep up the bridges between East Haven and New Haven. So they... Uh, so New Haven annexed a, a good portion of, of uh, East Haven, now called the Annex, which includes parts of Fairhaven, Morris Cove, and, and other places like that. And um, so before that, 1870-ish time, 1880, uh, that was part of East Haven. So a lot of the records for, for Pink and Stepna, we found in the East Haven church documents and the East Haven property and probate records. But on the flip side, a lot of the documentation around the Morrises was found at the Whitney uh, Museum at the, at the New Haven, I mean, Whitney Library at the New Haven Museum. So on the left, we see the um, emancipation of Pink and her name here is spelled P-I-N-I-K. And we could see uh, that's on the left side and on the right side, we can see the emancipation of Stepna, um, you can see the name here, Stepna. And uh, so these documents helped us see kind of like we saw, we found that they were, they were married. Uh, now we're seeing that they were um, freed. And then there, we, that was the beginning of our trail to find other records to help us understand the lives of Pink and Stepna. So we're at the point now, we have records all the way up into the 1830s um, and uh, showing uh, property transactions between uh, Pink, uh, Stepna Pink and other members of the East Haven uh, Society. Is this you, Joy? Yeah, I just realized I was mute. So um, when Dennis and I were invited to do this talk, we said, okay, let's throw down our, what our aspirations are. Um, and so this was our reference to the 2001 um, paper that was published by uh, a group of Yale grad students and uh, the Amistad Committee that documents um, Yale's uh, and its history of slavery and abolition. Next slide, yeah. Um, in 1755, um, Ezra Stiles, who at that time was a minister in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, decided uh, to invest in a venture that one of his parishioners had. And so he sent a hogshead of rum with this parishioner who was a slave trader. Um, on the Guinea coast, uh, he sent the hogshead of rum so that in return, he could receive um, an African boy who would be his enslaved um, servant. Um, when this young boy arrived, uh, Stiles chose to name this boy Newport. Uh, and in his journals, uh, the following year, Stiles walks into his kitchen one day and he finds the boy crying in his, in his kitchen and he says to himself, holy, you know, crap, I've really screwed up and done something wrong. It touched his heart to see that he realized that this African boy was going to be taken from his home, from his family, from everything that he understood as important parts of his life for the rest of his life. And so in that moment, Stiles recognized what he'd done and he also felt remorse. 
Um, the next slide, please. In Ezra Stiles College, which was um, constructed in 1960 by, on Yale, by Yale University, um, they, they recently placed a plaque there uh, in 2016, uh, noting that uh, there were three enslaved people who were possessed by um, Ezra Stiles. Actually, I'm going to correct that. Jacob and Aaron were indentured and Newport was initially enslaved in 1778 um, when Ezra Stiles assumed the position as president of Yale University, Yale College at that time. Um, he manumitted Newport um, as he left uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and he thus uh, Newport got his freedom. On um, the 23rd of December, 1782, Newport arrived in the city of New Haven on uh, Stiles' doorstep and asked him for sanctuary for Newport, his wife, and his two-year-old son, and agrees to the pay of 20 pounds per year to be a servant to Stiles for seven years. He also agrees to the indenture of his two-year-old son to Stiles until his son is 24 years old. Next slide. By um, a review of the Ezra Stiles uh, literary diaries, we were able to find uh, the indenture of Aaron. And it reads, I, Ruth Wolkett, an Indian squaw widow living at Killingworth, do hereby bind and put unto President Stiles of New Haven, his executor, administrator, and assigns my son Aaron, now nine years old, to serve and live with Stiles as a family servant till Aaron shall be 21 years old or until the last day of May, 1795. And I, Stiles agreed to learn Aaron to read and to give him a Bible and to give him a freedom suit when he shall come out of his time suitable for him. At the very bottom of the Stiles diary, um, it says, by mutual agreement, the boy was given back to his mother in May 1783. Dennis and I assume that that's because Jacob had become indentured um, the winter of 1782-83. Next slide. And so here's our proposal to Yale. We figured why not throw down, right? <laughs> um, that a witness stone be placed at Connecticut Hall, which is the oldest building uh, in downtown New Haven. And it was built, uh, it was constructed in 1750 and I think finished around 1752. Um, Ezra Stiles definitely taught in that building, and we hypothesized that perhaps Newport, Jacob, and Aaron would have spent some time in that building. And so we hope to link all these stories and to link the history of the enslaved people to um, the history of New Haven. Um, this would be a collaboration, certainly with the Connecticut Freedom Trail, Witness Stones, Yale University. Next slide, Dennis. And um, I think this is kind of the foundation of why this work is so important to Dennis and I. History, as nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read, and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. James Baldwin. Thank you. Well, uh, th thank you, Dennis, and thank you, Joy. This was fantastic. We're right on time. I appreciate that, too. Um, <clears throat> we're asking our audience to send in their questions in the Q&A, not in the chat, which I mistakenly said earlier. So do indeed send us your questions. I, I will just start first, if it's okay, to both of you. One is a little specific question. Uh, Joy, 
that Morris Cove house, the Morris house, this that huge house. Um, I think you identified as many as eight enslaved people from the records who, at least eight, who lived there. Any ties between that Morris family and that house and that, that farmstead or whatever it was to Yale? That's my specific question. Do, do we know that? And then more broadly, um, the Witness Stones project is still in its, in kind of in its infancy. You've, you've placed a few of these and there could be many, many, many more which then lends itself to tours and student projects and many, many other things. And I love the idea of that first stone on the Yale campus, which could be right over by Connecticut Hall, uh, could be a product of the Yale and Slavery Project, who knows? Um, but how do you imagine this, say, 10 years out, five, 10 years out? Mm. How do you want this to develop? Um, as both, I mean, you guys are intrepid. There, there are two of you, and then there's this other group of teachers. Uh, you're going to have to probably raise some money, I can imagine. Nothing happens without it. Uh, but what would your best case scenario be as to how this would develop into a, a project that the public really knows about in Connecticut and New England? over the next five to 10 years. So one's a specific question, the other's a much broader one. Go ahead. <laughs> so the answer to the first question is that as of yet, we have not been able to link Amos Morris in any way to Yale University. Uh -huh. Although one of the stories that kind of pulls all of the Connecticut coastline together is the story of the British invasion on Monday, July 5th, 1779. One of my favorite stories, one of my favorite dates. Uh -huh. um, because everybody's story all comes together. The British come into West Haven. They come into Morris Cove and they burn down the, the uh, part, what we now know as the Morris Pardee House. And uh -huh. Captain Amos Morris and his sons and hundreds of people along the shoreline all come together to deal with the British invasion because there was no militia here. There was no group of people who they could just say, okay, you guys get out of your fort and go run over. Everybody had to say, where's my gun? Where's my, where's my powder? Um, and then get out there. And Ezra Stiles goes to the tallest building at Yale, looks with his light, with his glass, out to the harbor of West Haven and because people are ringing church bills all over saying the British are coming and he looks and he sees um, the British in the West Haven Harbor. Uh, and so if I had a kind of a, a linking story, that would be my linking story. It's just such a dynamic that's, story. That's brilliant. Um, uh, you uh, you you just beautifully auditioned to be a co-writer on the Yale and Slavery Project <laughs> report in the what what a narrative what a, you know we got to have that in chapter one there that, that was beautiful and uh, then Dennis answers part two oh yeah yeah, yeah. The, 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 David the, um, some some of my board part. members are uh, some of the board members of the Witness Stones Project are um, are are our attendees, so I have to be, no. But that's the question we're asking is, uh, you know, as of- Go ahead, right raise now, a little money here, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. but as of right now, our, our project has expanded to historic Deerfield and to uh, the Stoutsburg, uh, in Massachusetts, the Stoutsburg Sourland mm -hmm. um, African American mm -hmm. Museum in central New Jersey. Uh, we're talking to folks in Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, we're going to be putting stones in, um, we have like three communities right now, but we're going to have a, over a dozen communities at the end of the school year. And we're engaging like th just this year, 15 schools uh, throughout Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And we have a few visions. One is to plant a, a, a seed or a bush or a, or a sapling in communities and have it spread within that community. So Old Lyme, we're working with the middle school to put two stones in, but the historical 
organized, they formed the Witness Stones Committee in Old Lyme and they plan on putting a dozen stones in. So we're, mm. we're planting it and it's gonna be growing in these communities. Mm. Um, my job, my goal is to teach teachers and to teach educators sure. and then have it diffuse, you know, by anthropology undergrad, right? Diffusion, have it work from community to community that way. Um, and, and, and also we're part of this network. We have a couple networks that we're involved with, including um, NESRI, the New England, and the Northeast Slave Registry Index. We're working with uh, Professor Benton from uh, John Jay College to, uh, to get information, to, make, uh, 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 to, to list the enslaved people throughout the Northeast. We're working with a group called Atlantic Black Box, which we're, uh, that started out in Maine, but we're trying to tie the stories together that way. And, and I have a new friend who wants to meet you, uh, Charles Roberts from the uh, Rhode Island Slave, um, mm -hmm. uh, slave uh, Medallion Project, where he has QR mm -hmm. codes that he puts on these, uh, slave med these medallions. And then you could have, say, a dozen stones on in New Haven, and then if someone could walk up to this one uh, a podium or plaque or on a building bring up to the QR code and all of a sudden that walking tour of Witness Stone's walking tour of New Haven could pop up right from there. So we have, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of irons in the fire and we're meeting wonderful people everywhere we go. As you know, every, anytime you start to work with people who are trying to tell the story of New England slavery, you find wonderful practitioners and, and researchers and educators throughout. So that's that's our that's how we're doing it. <laughs> well, Dennis and Joe, I can tell you, I mean, this is precisely the kinds of projects here at the GLC we want to get behind. So, you know, the whole idea of our center is to take what Yale can do in teaching and creating knowledge, but take it outside of the campus, out to the public. So we'll we'll get the shoulder of the GLC behind this, however we can. I got a lot of questions here though, and some great sure. ones. Uh, so uh, get ready. First from Matt Quaylen, Matthew Quaylen, who is uh, law school here at Yale and one of our researchers on the Yale and Slavery Project. Uh, he, he just wants to thank you, but here's the way he does it. He says, Connecticut is very adept at honoring abolitionists. For instance, my hometown, Farmington, his hometown, uh, teaches middle school students about its role in housing the Amistad captives, but much worse than remembering slavery. Farmington was home to dozens of enslaved people. So this project is long overdue and very appreciated. Have you encountered resistance and confusion? What has the reaction been among people whose self-conception this project challenges? I mean, are you, are you facing resistance either from schools or, or are you finding mostly people are cooperating? Well, we, you know, we're, we're blessed with having enough people come to us <laughs> that we yeah. don't, we, you know, we don't have to go out. That's we, good. I know uh, we, you know, we um, leaned into certain communities and they're still happy to tell the story of um, abolitionists. I'm, and, and I'm excited that people are starting to talk, tell the story of black abolitionists yeah. and black yeah. conductors uh, on the Underground Railroad. So that's a, that's a big start, but uh, for instance, I was just recently contacted and I've been working with people in Norwich. They did a great work on talking about black abolitionists in Norwich and, and, mm -hmm. the, and the free black community there. Now mm -hmm. they're ready to, now they want to talk about the enslaved people. They want to talk about two generations before. So that's the best case scenario, but not everybody's ready. <laughs> yeah, and I think that there are some institutions that are definitely a bit reticent mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and holding back a bit because they're concerned about their donors who may be people who have prominent names, uh, Bishop Munson, you know, the founders of the New Haven colony, all of these names, there are hundreds and thousands of descendants who are on, you know, ancestry, daughters of the American Revolution, sons of the revolution, and those folks have their interests. So yeah. we expect there will be pushback because it changes narratives that they've been taught and raised with um but the young people are also asking for this students oh, yeah. for educational justice come to mind you know they testified at the connecticut state house so mm -hmm. it's their time this has long been the the question for you know half a century and more of the collisions that occur over when, when we when we do black history but often that means the collisions become fruitful for everybody, that's the whole point. Um, uh, here, uh, 
Uh, so a few specific questions. Are the slides available in some way to send out? Uh, I, I guess that's a question of whether you want to release your slides and we certainly can put them out. Uh, you, you, you I'm can... happy for you to share the recording and I, okay. I think, uh, Joy, do you feel that way? Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. Public yeah. knowledge, yeah. good, yeah. great. Um, would you please, maybe Joy, you'd want to take a quick crack at this. Uh, this person, uh, Zoe Resch, asks, could you give a little more information on that 1792 law? I, so in 1792, um, the state of Connecticut determined that in, uh, that someone who is manumitted, so someone who is a f enslaved person who is then freed, um, will no longer be dependent a dependent of their master. So prior to that time, if you were freed and you became indigent and could not pay your own bills, feed yourself, find shelter, the person who had been your master had to pay your bills, take you in, feed mm. you, take mm. care of your health care and whatever else. The 1792 law says the, that um, former owner is no longer has no longer has that responsibility. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Uh, which did affect when, how, and if people manumitted too, right? Because yes. they had to. They yeah, had there to was manumit and get rid of these responsibilities, right? There was a window that's between twenty five and forty five, and there was yeah. also. Um, in in all and you you in his age group. out there might know better than I, but we, they started letting a lot more poor Irish, Welsh, and Scottish workers into yeah. uh, into New England. So owning an enslaved person for the entire year sometimes might have been more expensive than hiring uh, an Irishman for for the harvest season or something like that. You've kind of answered this, but maybe not entirely. This is an anonymous attendee who's obviously not in New Haven County, who says, how many stones have you put down? And is this centered primarily in New Haven County? Clearly it's not. Yeah, well, right now, uh, we, we, there's about, uh, there's over 20 stones in, in West Hartford. There are seven stones in Guilford and there's one in Madison. Right now mm -hmm. we're in, we're gonna be putting a stone in, um, in Nor Norfolk, which is the Northwest corner. Uh, mm -hmm. We're gonna be putting, um, I, four stones in Greenwich this year. We're going to be putting a stone in Killingly, 12 stones in, in Old Lyme. Um, and we're going to be working, we're working in uh, Simsbury next year. And we have wow. a, a whole list of people who are doing, we're working with the Wallingford um, Historical Society to do uh, some work there. So we, you know, we have that, that photo, you know, image, but right now there are just three locations, but um, by the end of this year, we'll be in, I think the only uh, county we're gonna miss is Tallinn County. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, here, well, this question is right along that same lines. And if you haven't made this contact, Dennis and Joy, here you are. Jennifer Galpern is writing from Rhode Island. She says, hi. And then with an exclamation mark, she says, this also needs to extend to Rhode Island. I work for the Rhode Island Historical Society and would love to be your point person. Would you be interested in sharing your model with us? So there you go, Jennifer. If you don't know Jennifer, yep. you do now. Yep, and, and Jennifer, I, I think you saw my email address, but it's dennis at witnessstonesproject.org. And, uh, and Charles Roberts is, is like my new best friend. So we're just gonna say, we're gonna, and you probably know him from the work he's doing in Rhode Island. So uh, I think okay. he has, um, uh, at least a half dozen of these medallions put out throughout. And they're almost more of a, um, about like a, a site of, um, what, what's the term I use, Joey? I'm sorry. <laughs> a site of conscious, more of a site of a conscious where you could tell oh, yeah. more than one story. We, we think, and we talked before. Like museums about, of conscience. Yeah, yeah. Telling the story of an individual is so powerful. And then we build off of that story. Joy, isn't that great how you guys have only been doing this for a year, but Dennis is already asking you to finish his sentence. And, you know, it's like, uh, uh, I won't go any further with that. Uh, here's another volunteer. Andrea Gale Bennett uh, writes from Massachusetts. She says, I don't, I don't have a question. I would just like to say thank you for this presentation and your efforts. I look forward to its expansion to Massachusetts. 
So you're already in Deerfield, I hear. Yeah, we're in Deerfield, and and they're so excited to interpret around. They they've already done work with uh, uh, Rob Romer, uh, uh, yeah, Professor yeah. Emeritus up at, at uh, Amherst, a, a physics professor emeritus. We want to say. I, I know Rob from my days at Amherst College, and he 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 was a physicist with a deep interest in local history. Wow, well, I can tell he gave you. me my tool. He gave me my toolbox. I I, really? I, I, I read his book that he wrote. Uh, I haven't heard from him in quite a while. Slavery Maybe he in, tuned in, in uh, today. I hope so. Yeah, slavery in um, uh, Connecticut River Valley in Massachusetts. He writes about Deerfield, yeah. and he yeah. gave me the toolkits. Like, where do you find enslaved people? Property mm -hmm. records. Well, that's you know that's that's Rob Romer. And Another Andrea's question? one of my oldest friends. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> we went to high school together, and she oh, lives okay. in Lynn, Massachusetts. Lynn, we're coming to you. All right. All right. Well, hey, I'm, this is it's just good that we're on a webinar instead of in person in this case. Here's another, uh, a Tammy Higgs writes and says, this is more of a historical question. Was it common practice for slave owners to manumit older enslaved people so they were not required to take care of them? At Sully, where I work, we have documented, we have documentation of, quote, old Davy of no value. So no manumission there. Sully, is that in Connecticut? S-U-L-L-Y, or I don't know. Anyway, how common was manumission? Have you come up with any uh, sense of that? Can, you know, I'll do this one, Joy. What, what, what I found is that um, looking at different communities and, and going around, uh, before the 1792 law, it wasn't common, uh, or at least it wasn't evident. So you would see it in Wales and places like that. Yeah. But because Connecticut, because the, uh, we'll just say the Yankees were a little tight with their money, Connecticut <laughs> put a law in place saying that you couldn't, if you freed your enslaved person before 1792, you were responsible for them in their old age. Right. So remember Moses, we were talking about him. Yeah. He, he worked so hard and gained so much money, he was able to pay for his enslaver's son to go to Yale. Yeah. But um, when he got older, um, Reverend Amos Fowler, who's also a Yale fellow, um, is um, he, he didn't free Moses, but he made his children responsible for him. So one way to protect the estate is saying, we're gonna keep it within us. We're gonna, you know, my, he, he demanded that his children take care of Moses. So mm -hmm. that was more often happened because if you freed him and Moses ended up in the poorhouse, you'd have to pay, you know, cash money right. <laughs> to support him right. versus if right. you kept him in the household, you could support him that way. So we saw, and it wasn't always evil. It was sometimes that, that you know, for Moses being freed at 65 might not have been the best thing for him, although, the co-chair of the Witness Stones Project, Pat Wilson Phineas, who was, <laughs> it was, that's her uncle, right? That's her, her fifth mm -hmm. uncle. And she, she believes that if Moses had the opportunity, he would have gained his freedom. And we mm -hmm. listened to Pat because we're telling her family story. So we're, <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you, I learned a long time ago, you, you listen to descendants. Whatever <laughs> facts you think you have on your side, you listen to descendants. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of questions here. They're great. Uh, are Mandy Benjamin writes and says, are you putting the program in elementary schools? You need a staff, Denison, a uh, Dennis, to get out to all these. Are you, are you, are you working with elementary schools? That's the question. That's a yes or a no, I guess. I so, know. yeah, well, the foot school class uh -huh. that we're working with is a, is a fifth grade class. Oh, Cold great. Spring, yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, yes. Well, another question, uh, Deborah Bruno, uh, what about the, what about New York's Hudson Valley region? Um, I would love to see it come over here. So <laughs> you guys are expanding all over the place here. This is fantastic. Well, we, we're working with the two schools in uh, Dobbs Ferry. Uh -huh. The, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, the Historic Hudson Valley mm -hmm. does a fantastic job. And they have a facility in Sleepy Hollow named... Skyler, and I can't remember. I, I, I'm so sorry, I can't remember. Yeah, they yeah. do a fantastic job. They tell the story of slavery at their site. Um, oh, yeah, but yeah. if you think a lot of those Hudson Valley sites are doing that now. Yes, yeah. but but if, and they tell the story there. But if you think there was a lot of enslaved people among the colonial New Englanders, the Dutch maybe more so, yes. <laughs> maybe just a yeah. little more. Yes. Well. Okay, and uh, God, I've got a lot of questions here. I can't even get to them all. 
Um, <laughs> this person wants you in the Brook in her Brooklyn neighborhood. Um, so you know you got to get down to Brooklyn too. And yes, uh, well, just uh, says, says nothing but praise for this project. I would love to replicate it in Brooklyn. Well, someday maybe you can. Another person asked, how many of these? Uh, Witness stones either are already or may end up at churches, which is interesting if there's still functioning churches and lots of people see it every Sunday or whatever day. We'll, we'll say right that we, we like to say we 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 place the stones where enslaved people lived, worked, or prayed, and sometimes the best uh -huh. evidence we have of enslaved people are through the church records. So uh, we uh, in Norfolk we're working with the first congregational church there. And um, in Madison, we already put a, a stone in front of the church where um, our friend um, Jonathan Todd was a preacher. And mm -hmm. we put a stone there. Latus ends up in the records. We're going to put another stone there, Latus's mother. We're working with, uh, I'll say, the congregational churches in Connecticut, as well as the, um, the Episcopal churches, are really examining their complicity yeah. with slavery. Yeah. And they are some of our best partners. Uh, in That's Guilford, we have, a, we have a stone in front of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church wasn't around during the time of slavery, but two buildings before, yeah. uh, uh, Dr. Pynchon lived there. So we have Joaquin's stone in front of the Catholic Church, and they were happy to embrace the story there, too. So the churches are, are, are one of, some of our greatest partners. Oh, yeah, and a common historical phenomenon, churches changing hands over generations. Um, and ministers being one of the most common occupations of enslavers. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, this one's this question is interesting too. And Tom Thurston, I hope you're taking notes here. He's our <laughs> education director. How can we get this into the statewide curriculum? What you know, this should be required in courses and so on and so forth. I mentioned Tom because, as some people here know, Tom is deeply involved in the state social studies association and in the now state. Connecticut State mandated project for Latino and African American history in high schools. So we, uh, you know, you, down, down the road anyway, you're going to need a full time research assistant here. So we have to raise some money. We could find you the research assistant. Yeah, we're talking about raising money. Right, right now, we survive off of uh, fee for service. We, we literally get, I get paid to provide teacher workshops and do research. Uh -huh. And we really, to bring it to that next level you were talking about, I think your first yeah. question, we yeah. do need, uh, we need help. We need, we need individual help. We need foundational help because, uh, you know, and we're, you know, we're a 501c3. Our right. curriculum is, uh, is, is, is uh, you know, copywritten and, yeah. and, and the five themes are what's something we developed ourselves. So these are all things that, yeah. you know, we, yeah. we want to be able to grow, but we, we can only grow. Uh, this you know, has been the product of your, imaginations and your friends yeah my uh, friends in guilford and now my friends throughout <laughs> literally and, and and that was my initial role actually was as research assistant to this project uh -huh. this project that we were doing collaboratively with the teachers from foot and coal springs and uh -huh. the new haven museum i was the digger i was the yeah Research. You're good at that. <laughs> well, didn't you two actually meet in, in the library of the New Haven History? Meeting? Yes, at the Whitney, at the Whitney at Library. The Whitney yeah, you were both just doing yeah. some work and, and, there. And that's how well, you... and, and Josh, <laughs> I, I think Josh and, and, Khalil, Josh and Khalil yeah, brought us together. Yeah, and, right. um, and, yeah. and then we, you know, as only as you can when you're talking about people 250 years ago, you become fast friends because we, yeah. we're the only ones who can talk about the Bailey brothers. It's the, well, well, yeah, it's the history nerds thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we know about that. We know about that. Anyway, you know, well, well let me just say a word here. Then if there's anybody out there in our audience who uh, <clears throat> wants to help out, uh, I'm in an almost constant fundraising mode here for the Gilder Lehrman Center uh, because our future is at stake coming as early as this summer. But if anybody wants to contribute to this project, uh, we would happily get behind it and indeed provide Joy and Dennis uh, a paid research assistant and some other resources, especially for teachers uh, already, you know, to expand Dennis on the project you've already created. So if anybody out there wants to help out, uh, 
you have, uh, I believe, the email and phone number of the Gilder Lehrman Center. So, and, and, and the focus of the project isn't going to be just to bring the project to places that can afford it. Our focus, yeah, yeah, yeah. we oh, want yeah. to get the money to bring it to places. So, uh, because it's, the project changes with who your audience is, and okay. and, and and we 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 would love to have a more inclusive and colorful curriculum for our our you yeah. know, our students here in, in New Haven and other places yeah. like that too. We're One gonna have to harness support. this Q and A. Here, here's a, somebody already put up the uh, website of the the Greater Hudson Valley project. Uh, we can harness that. that. That came in to us from Bill Sullivan. Matt Matthew Quaylen just put in another note. It's it's great. It's a great idea. He says New York City had a very high concentration of enslaved people, nearly ten percent in some periods. So Brooklyn would no doubt be a fruitless place. You could put a thousand of these stones in Brooklyn. Uh, it, it, you know, down the road when you're a, a corporation with 10 employees or something. <laughs> um, my goodness. Uh, I, I'm, I'm still scrolling through questions. Oh, is, the, is someone just asked simply, do you have a map of all of your current locations for the stones? Is, is it like on a website or? Um, not not yet. I do have a. Um, it's hard to keep it up. I'm sure. Yeah, well, we're working on it, and and I think this summer is going to be our goal because we'll have uh, we'll have so many more in so many more communities. But I right. do have. If they want to email me at Dennis at WindowStonesProject.org, I can give them a, a, a Google map I created just for the Guilford. Oh, uh, okay. uh, so the seven stones, and they're all walking distance from the Guilford Green. This wow. summer we're going to put, or this spring we're going to put three more up in North Guilford. Uh -huh. And uh, so it's not walking distance, but it's uh, we have nice coffee shops here and support your local businesses. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, we're all yearning to go spend some time in coffee shops. Uh, I go in and get get a coffee once in a while and hurry back out. You know, never sit down. Um, oh, just uh, this is an earlier question. During COVID, this person is asking: Are there particular websites? Are there particular uh, places i don't know again dennis you've already told us about this but the kinds of research you have done from census to church records and so on is there anywhere people can go to just understand how that research is done other than coming to one of your seminars yeah <laughs> so there, yeah there certainly are um websites that you can use um one the way i started on all this 25 years ago was my family genealogy. Sure. That's, sure. that's how I cultivated all of my research skills yeah. and digging skills. Yeah. Um, and Made so you unafraid you, of, of the internet and doing research, right? right. Yeah. yeah. And so if you have a subscription to ancestry.com already and mm -hmm. you've been working on your family genealogy, um, you actually, when you're on your computer, it's harder on your phone or a, a tablet, but when you're on your computer, you can um, access the church records. Mm -hmm. So the first congregational church of New Haven, you can access their church records um, that are all digitized. And that's how you can find, it's always gonna be towards the back, the mm -hmm. list of the all the enslaved people who are married or their deaths or their baptisms. Uh -huh. And that's one of the ways that we started. Um, New Haven Vital Records, their, uh, their records are in um, book form, digitized on Google Books from 1638 to 1850. I have those two volumes. I don't know if there's volumes beyond that, but those are the two volumes that I have that that mm -hmm. I've been spending my COVID time raking through. Wow. <laughs> and then of course, there's always the finding aids at all, all of the historical societies and all of the university libraries. Um, and when you can get back in, then you can go look at the primary documents there. Yeah, and the Yale library, well, like this one I'm sitting in, it's glory. Uh, the Beinecke and the Sterling library have tremendous online finding aids and they're really pretty i can use them fairly easily and i'm not very good at that actually um there's one last kind of really big question here that's directed at me but i welcome joy and dennis to help me answer this it's, it, it comes from bob wolf he says if time permits um it would be interesting to hear uh professor blight 
my thoughts on how Yale has changed since that 2001 report was published. Well, all I'll say about that is this. That report came out in 2001. I was hired by Yale in 2002. I arrived here at the beginning of 2003. Just before I arrived at Yale, President Levin, then Rick Levin, with the law school, decided to have a major conference in response to that report because it got so much publicity. And there were, you know, a few issues about that report and about its accuracy. Um, <laughs> President Levin decided with the law school to fund a major conference about universities and slavery and particularly Yale's background with this. And I got asked before I even worked at Yale, I hadn't even arrived here yet to give the keynote. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, what am I waiting into here? And I told them, yes, I will give a talk on the problem of the memory of slavery in America, but I won't concentrate on Yale because I don't know the research. I, I don't know the story. And, I, and I, I did that. And it was an extraordinary conference. And somehow I got through that all right. Uh, but from there, within a year, I was directing this center. Now, shortly before that, the Amistad Memorial was, was just uh, unveiled. I think that was about the year 2000. Um, and then the, the center here at Yale has expanded a good deal too. We've done all kinds of conferences, all kinds of panels. We did a major conference here in the late aughts on the problem of historical repair for all kinds of historical crimes uh, all over the world. Um, but also, you know, many events have happened, uh, for those who don't know, uh, including the major controversy over the naming of Calhoun College uh, in 2015 and 16. That led to a renaming, well, that led to lots of controversies and problems, but then ultimately to the renaming committee, which uh, John Witt, my colleague in the law school, chaired brilliantly. And actually, just last week, gave a presentation to our Yale and Slavery Working Group, which was very helpful. Uh, and out of that came the renaming of Calhoun College. So there's a lot, and I'm, there's a lot of dots here I'm not connecting. But I guess I'd say, since Peter Salovey last, uh, whenever it was, August or September, uh, decided to appoint this major research study now. You could say Yale's a bit late on this, because there's several other, you know, many other universities that have done such studies um, and have different kinds of histories with this. Universities in the South, like UT Austin, Virginia, and so on and so forth, UNC. And then universities in New England and so forth. Uh, we may be a little late getting to this as a full scale study, but nevertheless, it's now being done. But there's this long history of, of shouldering up to this question and I, and I guess I would just say the Gilda Lehrman Center here, now 22 years old, was the first such institute or research center for the study of slavery and abolition uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, it was founded here in 1998, uh, mostly from the largesse of Richard Gilda, who passed away last year. Uh, now there are oof, several such institutes, uh, two in England, uh, one in Canada, one at Brown University, and I'm soon, I think, one at Georgetown University, institutes that exist for the broad study of slavery, abolition, and their legacies, and so on. Uh, so that's the best I could do at that kind of big, broad question. Many things have changed in 20 years. Um, back when that report was done in 2001, it was a was a testy sort of shocking moment, I think. And there was a, I can remember David Brian Davis telling me, who was my predecessor here and the founder of this center, <laughs> he said in his very quiet, gentlemanly way, he said, well, Yale was certainly glad they had this little center for the study of slavery when that report reached the press because our phone rang off the hook. So, you know, yeah. Um, but I don't know if, if either of you have a sense of that from living in this broader community. 
Uh, I, I live inside of this place, so I'm myopic about it. But uh, I don't know if, if either of you have thoughts on that question. So I think I can say but, that as someone who, while I I work on the med school campus, mm -hmm. so which seem, can seem like miles away mm -hmm. from old campus, um, certainly, um, that the 2001 report was like an explosion. Cool. Yeah. And yeah. I printed it and I read it at that time and really? you know, it blew my head off. Yeah. Um, but I, and, I, and many people in the community, students, faculty were very disappointed at the response by the university at the time. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that if there had been a more robust response, what mm -hmm. happened in Calhoun College might not have happened, but it happened because there was no response. Yeah. And the what happened in Calhoun College fortunately led us to um, the Yale and Slavery Project. Yeah. Our friends in Glasgow at Glasgow University yep. and other universities in the world are throwing down at us and asking us, how right. can we find ways to step up? Yeah and to yeah. really own the history. And I was very pleased in the meeting that we had with Dr. Salovey, President Salovey, when mm. he essentially gave us a carte blanche. Oh yeah. And I'm yeah. gonna take him up on it. <laughs> we all are. You know, I, I think are. it's like you oh, gave me, my, in this I am going to show my carte blanche every time someone obstructs me in my <laughs> efforts to dig yeah. at this history. And we are going everywhere we can go on this. Right. Um, and well said, Joy. Well said. No one is no one is paying me for this, too. That's the I other know. thing is, this is all my we money that I make taking care of cancer right. patients. That's paying for all of my books. <laughs> <laughs> and when I can travel, all of my travel, and I will be certainly going to Charleston. Um, and some other places to yeah. dig out this history in archives because that's where, yeah, that's the that's what that's where the pointer is leading me to. Well, that's the entrepot, you know, as you know, for nearly half of all Africans who came into North America came in through Charleston, and Charleston is building this magnificent new museum there. I'm actually speaking for that museum on a webinar, and I don't know. A few weeks, um, but yeah, I, and I, I would add to what you said, or just join you. In, we have the total cooperation on this project of the entire library system, president's office. Uh, nobody's obstructing anything here, and I mean, in the end, whatever comes out of this report, we will do is ultimately the the call of the board and the president and so on, but. A lot of us will have some, uh, I'm sure we'll have some recommendations. Um, well, um, I Just think- Just raised hand. Oh, there is, okay. Uh, who, who's who's, that, who's that? Oh, let me see if there's a question in here. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, Mom, oh, Michelle raised her hand. Michelle, okay. I think you're telling me the time's over, right? Is that what you're telling me, Michelle? Yes. Yeah. Okay, go ahead and jump back on, Michelle. Uh, I think I need to bring you back in at the end. Is that right? For Michelle, join us uh, just for a final uh, announcement. Uh, actually, I think I just forgot to unraise my hand, but oh, oh, uh, okay. yes, I, I, I think it is time to close up shop, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, thank right. you, Dennis and Joy, for a marvelous presentation. And thank you, all the attendees, for your great questions and comments. And Daniel, did you have something you needed to put up on the screen as we were? Yeah, there we are. There we are. OK. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, all the good stuff here. You can write to us if you want to volunteer. You can write to us if you want to donate. You can write to us and just say uh, how much you appreciate Joy and Dennis today. <laughs> which is what everybody's been saying in the in the q a so uh, thank you all for attending and uh, uh ha have a wonderful day it's not snowing in new haven so en enjoy the day <laughs> and joy thanks and dennis thank you so much thank you what a, what a what a what a great day thank you all tremendous yes. presentation pleasure thanks.